I take more of a, a route of non-intervention. I really want the fruit to be the star. I approach the winemaking like a grape grower where uh, once I feel like the fruit's in, it's good quality, just let it do its thing and let it evolve into what it's gonna become. And I think that when I look at the, the end style of our wines, they're never the most uh, in your face, bold wines. They tend to be more on the slightly subdued, elegant side, the complex with many layers that maybe sometime need a few years in, in bottle to be able to really come into their own. So they're ageable wines. Um, and I'm fine with that. And I don't need it to be its best on that day. I just need you to get a sense that it's an evolving thing and that hopefully we'll pinpoint that time when it's best to drink. That kind of non-intervention approach lends itself to wines and characteristics of wines that are, uh, like I say, layered, complex, and understated. But as you drink it, you're, you're able to pick up so many more things. And it's not just this bold, in-your-face, oaky, fruity thing. As we uh, become a little more popular as a winery and the wines tend to sell out a little bit quicker and become a little bit more sought after, there is a real challenge in that you're not able to supply perhaps the number of people that you'd want with some of your, your products. The decision for me going forward is going to be whether to use more of our fruit, so a few more rows every year of my fruit, would it change it? if we up the production? And would it also take that fruit away from some of the winemakers that I've grown to respect and admire and really am equally excited about finding out what they can do with our fruit? I'm very happy with the status quo and as long as we can continue to, you know, have healthy vines and make wines that uh, people continue to enjoy, that to me is what it's all about. It's, a, it's hard work and it's every day, but it's, there's nothing more rewarding at the end of the day, knowing that you've influenced the grape vine right through the whole process to the end bottle. We didn't grow Chardonnay because we were encouraged to plant Sauvignon Blanc and we probably never would have succeeded as a winery if we didn't have the Sauvignon Blanc. So, and I'm thinking that maybe the next thing I would plant would be Chardonnay because I think it's, uh, it's what Niagara, along with Pinot Noir and Riesling, will really become known for on the world stage. Maybe we need to find varieties that are a little more winter sensitive for some of the colder areas. But perhaps those colder areas are now gonna become warmer areas. So I'm anxious to see in the next five, 10, 15 and beyond years, um, just what this climate is gonna give us. It seems to me, more so than a warming trend, uh, I'm seeing extreme weather patterns. So whether it's more rain or more storms, more dry years, it just seems to be up and down. And now that Niagara's got some really established old vines, they seem to be able to weather through those extremes because they've got deeper roots and they're more established. So my worry is that some very young plantings, when faced with such extremes, could suffer. I've always felt like, and this is you know, coming down from my grandfather, who was a great steward of the land, and my father as well, that that's what I would want to do, is take care of the farm and give the next generation at least the opportunity, should they want it, uh, to have the same passions and nightmares and all of, of the above that I've been able to have. Small wineries, uh, although seemingly very fun and, and exciting, there's a fine line between the fun and the excitement and the realities of um, being at the mercy of both the quality of your wine and the weather and the fickleness of the consumer and the comparisons to other wine regions. The neat thing for me is to see that there are small producers succeeding. The big guys are always gonna do well and I think they kind of drive the industry in terms of buying grapes 
and uh, you know the liquor boards and everything like that. But you're starting to see more and more smaller producers focused on viticulture and producing premium grapes and not worried about quantity uh, being very successful. And I think that's what it's going to take to really drive the quality aspect of the industry. So, so let's hope and let's you know count on the fact that we can drive that forward both in Niagara and in other places like Nova Scotia that um, to me is, is an expanding beautiful place to grow grapes and, um, and make wine. Good, awesome. Thank <laughs> you.